It is so good to be here today, you all. I am so honored that Pastor Robert and Pastor Taylor have invited us. And I'm telling you, they have set it out. They have treated us well. We are not at Motel 6. We are living our life, right? <laughs> Thank you all. You may be seated at this time. As I look at the, uh, what happened today, I look at, this was so God-ordained, the christenings that happened. Because we want to talk about love, but we also, the christenings that happened with those beautiful babies that I just want to suck their cheeks. Those, this is so fitting for you all to have a visual picture of what we're going to be talking about. Because what we're going to talk about today is, comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, which is the love chapter. Now, let me give you a little backstory. My name is Love. And so because of my name being Love, and my mother and father were very intentional about calling me Love. Now, my father was not, my mother was. She named me Love because of her love for my dad. They were married 60 years. I love them, right? They're going home with, to be with the Lord. But my mother, I, I didn't know what she was doing, but I believe she was grooming me for this purpose. And she made me memorize the entire Corin 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, as I was growing up. Now, as I was growing up, I I would always look at the chapter, everything, you know, um, and read it, and, and everything looked normal. But then when I would get to the 11th verse of the 13th chapter, I was a little bit cons uh, confused. I was confused because of what it said in the middle of a love chapter, they throw this, uh, this verse in there, and I didn't understand why this verse was there. And the verse is 1 Corinthians 13, 11, which says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man or an adult, I gave up childish ways. That's the, the, um, the um, English standard. And then in the King James it says, I put away. And I wonder, what is, why are we going back to talking about a child in the middle of the love chapter? And then, you know, because the popular verses are over in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. That's what I call the does and does nots. Love does and love does nots. So love does uh, put up with some stuff and love does not act uh, crazy when they're doing it. So I began to say, what is this? And as I began to get older, and after 40 years of marriage, I realized, I realized that you can't do the does and the does nots until you deal with growing up. You cannot even accomplish four through eight until you master 11. That inner child will show up in your relationships and run it for years. That wounded child, that hurt child will show up and conduct your relationship and it will eliminate every fourth through eight, every love is kind, suffereth long, bears belief. It ain't gonna do none of that because the wounded child is hurting and it's showing up in your relationship. Y'all to ask him, what we gonna bring to the table? Some of y'all ain't got people who coming to the table. Some of you all are not coming to the table. You sitting in the high chair. So what I am going to talk to you about is this. I need to talk to you all. And the title of my sermon is Grow Up in Love. Look at somebody and say, grow up in love. Okay, y'all, let me tell you. You say, okay, she got a lot of attitude. They gave me permission. They might not bring me back, but they gave me permission today. So I ain't leaving nothing on the stage, okay? Everybody buckle up. I'm coming for you. <laughs> now, here's the thing. No childhood is perfect. None. We, because imperfect people raised us. You saw those loving parents come down here today with those beautiful children. 
Obviously, the ones that came up here, and even some of yours, they don't mean to hurt that child. If they could help it, that none of these children that they brought here today would ever suffer a trauma. What is a trauma? A trauma is an emotional wound. We understand physical wounds. We take care of physical wounds. But the wounds that happen on the inside a lot of times become ignored. And so what happens is because they become ignored, the insides of us, our emotions are wounded. Our behaviors on the inside are wounded and hurting and needing. But yet we don't address it. We neglect it. So what we have to do is I'm going to take you back to the time when you were that size that you just saw. I've got to take you back because what happens is this. There has been research to show that there are stages to development. Most of you all know this. There are stages to development. So at different stages of your life, you learn different things. We have to make sure that you understand what you were supposed to learn during those times, what you were supposed to receive during those times, and if you didn't receive them, why you might be showing up in your relationships the way you're showing up. I'm going to start with stage one. Stage one, and, and you know, this part right here, that's going to be a little bit of teachy, but, but bear with me because I'm going to relate it directly back to your relationships, okay? Stage one is birth through 18. Birth through 18, that's when you learn to trust. A baby has been receiving, when they're in a the womb, they're going to take what they want. You may not feed yourself in nutrition, give yourself nutrition, they're going to take it from you. And so, when they come out, the baby begins to cry because they don't have a way to communicate. And the way the mother responds or the caregiver responds will determine whether the baby trusts the world or not. So at that very early stage when that baby needs to be changed or needs to be fed or needs to be cuddled or needs to be hugged, when that baby needs that and it is not given to them, they begin to not trust that the world is safe. Some of you all's trust issues actually started all the way back then. Because you were ignored. Maybe somebody was too busy. Maybe somebody was a, had an addiction. Maybe somebody started too young. Maybe somebody did not know how to parent you. But whatever the situation, the trust issues can break down all the way from the beginning. And let me tell you all something. Here's the thing. Because trauma distorts how you see yourself, others, God, and the world, it cognitive dysfunctions. Because it distorts it and tells you lies about yourself, that is absolutely Satan's way to set us off course. Every child that just sat here, you know why they're praying over that child? Because that child is targeted. And especially with starting this young, that child is a target. I will not. He, Satan wants to abort their assignment. He wants to bring them pain. He wants them to suffer so they will never realize and come to fruition and understand they are made in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. If I can distort you from seeing who you are, then guess what? I got you. Because you disconnect from who you really are. So what happens when there is broken trust, the baby is crying and they, and, and they, and they don't get uh, taken care of. Maybe even sometimes they are not just not taken care of. What does that baby, they know they have to survive. So what do they do? Sometimes they become a parentified child. They are parenting the parent. Because the parent is not there to parent them. They said, well, if I could prop up this chair, we're going to switch roles. I'm going to take care of you because you have this addiction. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to cook while chicken dinners at five years old standing on a stool in the kitchen. I'm going to take care of the home, my siblings, myself. I'm going to parent and switch roles for you. I'm gonna be out there selling drugs so that I can come back and, bring, and, and keep the lights on. When we have to resort to parenting, we become a parentified child or we become that alpha child. I can't trust anybody. See, when you are neglected, what happens is this. You decide the world is not safe. I need to do this myself. 
I can't trust, so there is hyper-independence. I mean, people say, oh, these women are hyper, they so independent. Yes, some of them were forced to. They have been receiving messages since birth to 18 months during that cycle. They never learned to trust because the world wasn't safe. They knew for survival they had to do it themselves. And you walk in at their big age and want them to just surrender. That's a process. So what ends up happening, they become alpha children who become alpha women. Not covered. That's birth to 18 months. Stage two, two to three years old. At that stage, we learn that autonomy, that we are separate from our parents. So you'll see that two-year-old, everybody loves them little babies, but that some of them two-year-olds that showed up, yeah, I don't wanna. We call them terrible twos, we call them terrific twos because we confess, right? So the terrific twos show up and they learn, wait, so the umbilical cord really was cut. I am separate from my parents. So what you end up having to do is that the caregiver, they begin to, to want to some freedom. Now for some, the caregivers may have some kind of anxious attachment style and they really want that, that toddler who is hugging and attached. They want to control because they've had a house of chaos and they don't want anything that's going to look like it won't control, that they can't control it. So sometimes they will, when that toddler begins to walk or potty train, they become anxious themselves, the parent, because they've never actually healed. And so what ends up happening is if the caregiver, during that time when that two-year-old begins to realize that they are separate, when they begin to realize their autonomy and their freedom, if the care, and then they begin to potty train and feed themselves, if they feed themselves and make a mistake and the caregiver is harsh on them, or they, they are shamed, if they are ridiculed, if they are expected to overperform, that child, begins to select grace for themselves. Perfectionism. They need their parents. See, stress is reduced when we feel like we have the resources to handle what it, what, what it is that is a threat. For adults, it's okay. Uh, there's a threat at the door. Somebody's shaking my handle, but I got a gun, so my stress is reduced a little bit. For children, they have no resources. But the strongest resources for children and any of us is actually sources, uh, is um, social resources. Your person, that person who got you. Studies have shown that they put people in front of cameras, they, uh, they let them see, put the, they attach their brain uh, uh, to monitors, uh, uh, show visuals of threats. They watch the, the, the level of stress. Then they bring a person that they trust and love into the room and they hold their hand, that's all, just hold their hand. And they watch the same video and they see the stress being reduced. That person, which is why God designed marriage, reduces our stress. But for children, they realize my life source is this parent. I will change roles if I have to. I will be per perfect if I have to. I will take their, the, uh, whatever I need to do. I will be hard on myself. I will lie, I will cheat, I will do whatever I have to do to keep the security of my only social resource, no matter what that looks like. So what ends up happening? They lose grace, perfectionism, insecurity, overly dependent. Stage three, three to five years old, preschool years. That's when you learn how to be assertive. You learn how to play. You learn how to say, okay, you wanna come, to, you know, you're at the, let's go over here, let's play with our dolls or let's play with our trucks or whatever the case may be. However, this is the thing. When a child who is between three and five years old begins to learn how to play as a team and socialize, when that child actually does not know how to play, then they are rejected. They, are, they receive penalty for that. I remember my daughter who, uh, Tiffany over there, and, and she would, she, she's always loved to have all of her, so she had a Barbie house, and she would take those Barbies and she'd create all of the, the, the rooms and you know, it's open. So she, everybody was either sleeping or sitting at the table. So she invited all of her friends over after church. 
And so I walk past her room and I see, this is the truth, I see her friends on the floor like this, Barbie house in front of them, and they're staring like this. And I walk in and I say, why aren't y'all playing? Tiffany says, I don't want them to mess up my Barbie house. I said, girl, you're not gonna invite no kids over here and they can't play. I snatched them Barbies up off that thing. Here, you take this Barbie, you take that Barbie. Do you think they would wanna come back to her house? But see, when you uncheck, when they go unchecked, you learn that I'm not acceptable. The self-confidence happens and you may not even know why. So caregivers have to make sure that, that you, you, you play fair. Not a lot of anger outbursts. You share, you, ch you don't change the rules in the middle of the game because you lose it. You don't become aggressive. Not too shy where you can't play. Those are the different things. And when that doesn't happen, you will see it come up, uh, show up in their relationships. I'm gonna come back to that one. Stage four, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep moving. Self-confidence. Now, what happens is ages five through 11, through those early school years, self-confidence is learned. Kids learn that what they have done, they can actually be congratulated on. So when you see them doing their report cards or sports or music and things like that, they learn self-confidence like, okay, I have some gifts, I have some abilities, I have some uh, things I can do, I can do well. Now, that's great, however, if the caregivers during that time do not affirm their accomplishments, they still walk out feeling inferior to the other kids. So if the parent don't show up at your game, but you the star, you still, in, in spite of all of your wins, there's something in you that feels less than as you watch these other people celebrate. Or if your parent shows up and you do a great game, but at the end, they are criticizing the one shot you missed, you still feel some kind of way because you see the other ones who lost being at, at the pizza place afterwards and being celebrated. So what you have is a child who's feeling inferior, less than, and insecure, and not believing in themselves. No matter how, what it looks like on the outside, they still don't believe in themselves. Through all these stages, it's, it's very important, you all. It's not just that you will only learn it at then. You can learn any of these at any age, and I haven't even toppled trauma into the, the, the scenario. You can learn them, and they all pile up. So by the time you get to this next stage, which is the teenage years, if you have had any of the experiences with the other ones, then you might show up as a teenager insecure, feeling inferior, feeling less than, trying to be perfect, all of this, and now you are at the most crucial stage, one of the most crucial stages that of your development, which is your identity. You're like, oh my goodness. That's why. The teenage years is such a target for Satan because now is whether you find out or not that you are made in the image and likeness of God. Whether you will accept that as your identity or not. He has tried to work to make sure that you are detoured off that path all of your life. And he is not stopping now. So once you get to the teenage years, the identity is formed, made in the image. If the caregivers do not affirm and, and show up, and, and let me tell you, once I said, you won't be able to be perfect. I, I messed up and did things wrong. I know how to apologize to my girls. And, and so what I'm saying to you is this, when you are just trying, the, the goal is actually to balance my good days, outweigh my bad days so my kids don't complain. That's what your, your goal is, is to not give them, you give them more happy memories than traumas. Now, once they're in that teenage stairs, then, and they have formed their identity, and some, you can see it in the high school uh, uh, cafeteria, this one will identify as a jock. This one will identify as a nerd. This one will identify, and there's so many more identities now. 
But after those teenage years, stage six is the next developmental stage of our lives, which is, stage, is ages 19 through 40. And guess what that is? Intimacy versus isolation. That's when you're supposed to show up for love. Ooh. By the time you showed up for love, a lot of times we ask, what you bring to the table? I'm not asking what you bring to the table. I'm going to say who you bring to the table. Who at stage six, when you show up for love, are you bringing to this marriage? Are you bringing on that date? Who's sitting in the high chair? Who's sitting in the booster seat? Who is running around the restaurant disturbing other people? Because y'all in an argument, full blown. I'm going to go back and I'm staying within my time. I'll tell you what happens. I'm going to directly relate all of those stages to how you show up in a, in a relationship. Because the neglected infant, what we talked about, when the first Corinthians in the does and does nots, where it says in the uh, um, 13th chapter and the fourth verse, love suffers long and is kind, or love is patient and is, and is kind, that infant who has been neglected does not know the difference between long suffering and abuse. So you will show up under the guise of long suffering when actually you are in a toxic, abusive relationship. And you need to know the difference. You will not know the difference between long suffering and enabling. What is the difference, love? See, abuse is something that has, it's different from neglect. See, abuse is something that has been done to you that should not have been done to you. Neglect is something that has not been done for you or to you that should have been done to you or for you. And the neglected uh, infant, this is what happens when we are victims of neglect. It don't have to happen at infancy stage. It can happen at any stage. What happens with neglect is this. When they stop trusting and they become independent, they have a, also, a lot of times they will form a sense of entitlement. Entitlement says this. I don't trust that you're going to take meet my needs, and guess what? I'm going to meet my own needs. That affects their relationship with God, too. I don't believe you're going to do it, so I'm going to do it myself. Oh, you won't have sex with me? Watch me go get some sex. Oh, they, they have a tendency, one of the, uh, uh, the, the symptoms is constant comparison. Compare. You gave them three. See, they're the victim of your neglect. They, they will only see neglect in you. You will be trying, you'll be working, you'll be doing whatever you can, but they can only experience neglect. Because why? Because the child has shown up. Grow up in love. You can't bring a neglected child into a relationship and ask it to love and trust. Enabling is that thing where you, the, the difference is, enable is when you are doing and caring for somebody where they age appropriately should be able to do for themselves. They really should be able to do that resume. <laughs> but the parentified child in you does not mean, mind switching roles. I'll be the daddy today. I'll be the husband. I'll be the wife. I'll be the child. I will be whatever I need to be. Why? Because you don't believe that you have the glue for somebody to love you. So you will choose somebody who needs you rather than somebody who wants you. Also, so, so, so that, that long suffering, that actually means long tempered. Long tempered, meaning I know how to regulate. I know how to self-regulate. And that's part of adulthood. That's part of maturity, knowing how, as a child, you learn how to self-soothe. As an adult, you learn how to self-soothe. You learn how to breathe. You know how to learn how to pray. You learn how to walk away. You don't jump in and go screaming and crying at every time things happen. Let's go to the next one. That's, so that's how that um, neglected infant shows up or neglected at any stage. 
Number two, enmesh toddler. Enmesh means that you did never, your mom or your caregiver never allowed you to be separate from themselves, so you never was able to be independent enough to realize that you could handle some things that pertain to you to, uh, on your own. So how does that toddler show up? Well, see, the, the first Corinthians, the, the 13th chapter and the seventh verse says, love bears all things. See, there's the does and the does not. Love does bear all things. Bear all things. You can take in anything like I'm supposed to be able to bear all things. Actually, that bears all things is, is actually like a, a roof, a roof over your head. That is the support system. So the roof in that Greek, that Greek term uh, for roof, it, what happens is this, the, the, right now, if it were to rain, the roof can bear the weight of saying, I'm not gonna let this in this house. This will not disrupt us. But see, the enmeshed child has not separated from their parents, so they will bring these in-laws up into this house to totally rainstorm. They don't, they don't, they're not discreet about what they say. They don't shut their mouth. And then when your, your, your kinfolk looking at your, your, your husband or your wife side-eyed at the table, then y'all treat, treat them nice. No, you, you did that. You couldn't shut your mouth. You took your information way too far, and they don't have the grace to love uh, your spouse the way you do. Exposing. Social media, I'm mad at my spouse, I'm mad at my mate, so I go type it for the world to fit in, and by the time you done made up with them, before the posts go viral, then all of a sudden, you, you sitting there defending them. I have seen police officers, uh, uh, I used to work in the courts, in, in felony, felony bond court, and this is what the police officer said. They said, the, the, the most dangerous situations that we go into is domestic violence. And you know why? By the time we get there, when we begin to try to restrain that spouse or whoever they are in love with, if we go and handle them and try to pull them off, the woman will jump on us. They are afraid of the person who called to protect them. Because we are attached and we have not separated the wounded child to believe that the treatment that the toddler received is okay. So what you end up having when you have that and they have handicapped and, and it's you to be in, in a, 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 a weakened state, you have the baby men and you have the lazy Lucy's, the privileged princess. Yes, I said it. The baby men. That's the men who want to be babies rather than go out and job. They will let you go out and work a whole job, keep your car, and use your car to go see their side chick. The lazy Lucy say, I need a man who making a six figures, and how many figures you make? Nothing. But they want six figures, no education, and they want to sit down, and when you get home, they even cook the meal. Lazy Lucy's. But if you sit there and coddle boys, and you sit there and don't give the skills to the women, that's what ends up happening. And then they want to come and say, love make fears and fix my life. Grow up. Number three, the, the rude preschooler. That's the one who push, shove, all this other kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. I have another daughter who's nothing like Tiffany. She was like this. I'll never forget. I was standing in the doorway. She was in preschool. And they was going on the slide. There was this one boy in the class who was a bully. And, he, and they, the kids would be like, they would do like this. He was going up the stairs. Uh, I, I was just standing in the door. I happened to see this thing. He was going up the stairs, uh, up the slide. And he was in front of my daughter, and, and as she was walking up, he, he turned around like that, and she said, boy, you better stop it. I was like, you right, girl, you better tell him. <laughs> well, guess what? She's still saying, boy, you better stop it. Uncheck, you understand? So what I'm saying to you is this, that rule preschooler 
who is not a team player, unchecked, will show up in relationships, selfish, dominant, self-centered, inconsistent, inconsiderate, dismissive, because it's all about me. And that's male or female. I'm not talking about just men. A lot of times that rule priest comes, they will not accept the blame. They will not take accountability. They have poor conflict resolution skills. You got to show up, see if you're the one who is showing up as that, re, that rule preschooler or if you are in a relationship with them or you, if you are constantly choosing that because you are familiar with that type of relationship because you have mastered the skills to deal with it. Number four, the insecure adolescent. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant. A lot of times what happens is that insecure, once they, uh, 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 adolescent, once they have decided, oh, look what I can do, look what I am, look who I am, and so the, then they, they will be boastful, they will be arrogant, they will, and then that, that you will see contempt for the spouse. The spouse say something, and, they, and, and you see them roll their eyes. Roll your eyes is called contempt. It's one of the four, top four reasons, uh, predictors of divorce. Why? Because contempt says, I'm better than you. Contempt says, you're less than me. That's why you go up in a court contempting, you're going to find yourself in a jail and you're going to, oh, okay, so I am not as... Think of yourself no, not, not more highly than you ought. But the other side of an insecure person, some of them show up at arrogant, but inside of them, they are insecure. See, they feel like, you know, I, I, I can get this, I, can, I got this many women, I can do this. And so your insecurity, but you know what? Your insecurity as a, 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 a man who is going from body count to body count, but yet it, it says, if I was in a, a relationship that was, was, was uh, individual, that was, was, was um, with one person to love me, if they really saw inside of me, they might actually see what my parents saw that you haven't really dealt with. That insecure woman might say, you know what, I'm people pleasing, therefore sometimes these body counts have nothing to do with just being promiscuous, sometimes it's because boundaries have been, been uh, 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 exceeded sexually as a child. Sometimes it is because you, there has been other things that have occurred in their life. So you've got to understand when that happens. The next thing is the, uh, uh, the, the teen lacking strong identity. When the Bible tells the, uh, us to the love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth, that is talking about when we plan to do wrong, when we literally schedule and premeditate sin. And they feel like this is just who I am. This is what I'm going to do. I'm, you, you sat there and you cheated on me. I'm going to get my lick back and cheat on you. You premeditated. How to grow up. I have a few more minutes and I'm going to end it with that. First of all, you have to reparent yourself. You've got to nurture yourself. You've got to pour into yourself. That means meeting your needs. If the inner child needed some, some love, if the inner child needed some affirmation, if the inner child needs some support, then you need to support it. You need to, to make sure that you are speaking into the life of that child. Uh, the unconditional love. You have to make sure that you do not demand perfection out of yourself. Give yourself grace. Speak over yourself. Yourself. Make sure your self-talk is kind. Make sure you are saying inspiring words to yourself. Make sure you get some sleep. Make sure you're eating properly. Make sure that you are taking care of your mental health. Make sure you are praying. Make sure you are going to therapy if you need to see a therapist. Make sure you love yourself unconditionally and see yourself as God sees you. <laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person
in this congregation. I pray, Father God, that you will look and give them revelation of the times when they were had arrested development, but they will come up and rise up, Father God, and they will rise up in their full glory, Father God. They will heal, Father God, and they will move forward, and they will operate in abundance, and Father God, you are love, and they will know how to love correctly. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, can we show our appreciation to the incredible love, McPherson? Come on, y'all could do better than that. My only regret is that we didn't have more time. Some of y'all, well, I, we don't got the space, otherwise I would say double dip. Um, but thank you so much for giving us tools uh, that we can use. I am convinced that we cannot have a church that just shouts and dances over things, but we never deal with the deep issues that are affecting us. And so I'm thankful for the gift of Love McPherson to give us some practical handlebars. I saw light bulbs going on the top of somebody else's heads going, oh, that's why. <laughs> somebody are like, oh, that's why he's like that. <laughs> And uh, this is just the beginning of what God is doing in this series. I want to do one more thing. I'm going to ask every head be bowed and eyes be closed. Because I believe that somebody needs to respond today. You need to respond by surrendering your life to Jesus. What I love about this beautiful Savior is that he is a father to the fatherless. He is a mother to the motherless. He's able to bring healing to those areas of neglect and abuse. And what I love about it is he was the ultimate example when he came from heaven to earth, love personified. He said, I'm gonna pay the price for your sin. And all he asks is that you respond to him today. And so with heads bowed in this room at the Echo location, I just want to give somebody an opportunity to respond to this love. The love that laid down his life for you. And if that's you, you'd be so honored to say, hey, Pastor Robert, would you include me in this closing prayer? I need to give him my life today. Maybe the enemy was in your head today and you were taking all that information saying, well, that's going to take years for me to fix. Well, maybe it'll be a process, but this is the first step. To surrender your life to this Savior. And if that's you, I just want you to lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I could see it. Saying today's the day I'm giving him my life. Come on, you know when God's speaking to you. If that's you, would you lift up your hand right where you are? Maybe you were walking with God for a while and you turned your back and now he's calling you back home. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Echo location. Just lift up your hand right where you are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Come on, let's pray this prayer as one big family. We're all going to say it, but especially those of you who responded. Would you say this from your heart? Say, Jesus, I need you. Lord, thank you so much for showing me love. Lord, you showed me love by living the life that I was supposed to live and by dying the death that I was supposed to die. You took my place. So Lord, today, my response is to give you everything. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you my mind. Lord, I'm committed to the process of growing up in love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you meant what you prayed, would you give God praise? Come on, you can do that.